So hello everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for today's webinar, Leading with Emotional Intelligence in Uncertain Times. My name is Erin Bruff and I'm with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and my role in today's webinar is to be your moderator. So I will be managing the Q&A function and the chat box through the presentation. I can assist you with any technology issues that you're running into, so please be sure to put them into the chat box. So please use the Q&A function um, if you have any specific questions for our presenters today. And we will have some interactive segments, so for that, please use our chat box. So today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Bob Rader, Executive Director of CABE, as well as the directors of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, Dr. Mark Brackett and Scott Levy. So first, I'd like to hand it over to Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Rader. And as Aaron said, I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. I wanna thank Dr. Brackett and Scott uh, for doing this. I think we're living at a time of, of great anxiety, uncertainty, and uh, there's nobody who would be better to turn to than the people from the Center for, uh, <laughs> Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale. I also want to thank Fran Rabinowitz, the superintendents on the uh, call, and of course, school board members. I really look forward to hearing from Mark and Scott. Scott, you may know or may not know, is also a school board member in Byram Hills, New York, and he has been chair. So he has some experience in what school board members are going through at this point. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Erin and thank you again for being a part of this. Thanks, Bob. So now I'd like to hand it over to Mark and Scott. Mark, if you'd like to offer your introduction. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I've met many of you before at different conferences and trainings across the state of Connecticut. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Brackett, and I'm a professor at Yale in the Child Studies Center and the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence and also one of the creators of RULER, which is an approach to social and emotional leanness in about 200 of our Connecticut schools. Scott? And I'm Scott Levy. Um, I am the executive director at the Center for Emotional Intelligence. I've been with the team for um, just about three years. And uh, I also, as Bob said, sit on the Byram Hills Board of Education, which is in Westchester County. So I can definitely relate to many of the issues that you're going through. And I sit on the board of the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association, which in these critical times has been you know, very helpful for us in our region. Uh, I also sit on a hospital board. So I'll try to bring all that experience to bear as we go through the webinar. Excellent. All right, everyone, so we're gonna jump in. We've got about 45 minutes together, and um, I hope we, we've created, I think, um, a powerful presentation to get us all thinking about the ways we can support our leaders, teachers, students, and even families. So uh, these are our websites and social media handles, and we're gonna be sending you information afterwards, so you don't have to worry even about that. The things that we're gonna to cover today are fourfold. We're gonna talk about faculty, staff, and student emotional well-being. We'll talk about district leadership in these uncertain times. Um, what do we mean by virtual school climate? And, um, and then thinking about ourselves as leaders and what are some strategies and tools that we can use to be um, the best possible role models for our schools and districts. So um, interestingly, you know, before this COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, we summarized the data across the United States to look at, you know, what does mental health look like in America? And what we know is that about 25% of children have school adjustment problems, um, about 60% in our most disadvantaged areas. Um, we know that about 45% of children have at least one A score, average childhood experiences. When it comes to anxiety, um, about 18% of our population is affected by an anxiety disorder, 25% of adolescents. And uh, unfortunately, um, and sadly, the recent data show that there's been about a 45% increase in suicide rates over the last 20 years. And among college students, it's the leading cause of death. Depression, I don't have up here, but on average, about 40% of our college students, even at a place like Yale, um, have depression. 
We also had a lot of research that we did and others have done on engagement in schools and stress and burnout. And what we know from across the state of Connecticut and you know, the United States is that about 20 to 40% of students are disengaged. Um, we know that sadly, 50 to 60% of employees report being disengaged at work. 13% say they're miserable. Our center has had um, and done a lot of research on educators themselves, because um, obviously one of our primary um, interest is in supporting teachers and being their best selves as educators. But what we know from research is that about 46% report excessive stress and anxiety. 85% are saying that work, li work life um, imbalance is affecting their ability. And um, about 30 plus percent, you know, leave the profession after just five years. Now, I present these data mostly because these are data from one year, two year, three years ago. And as we can imagine, you know, with what's going on in our country right now, and in our state in particular, these data are probably going to unfortunately um, look worse over the next uh, couple of months and year. Some of you may have seen me present these data before. It was a study that we did, a national study of 6,000 teachers across the United States. And what we found in this study was that about 70% of the emotions that teachers reported having as um, in their daily lives as teachers were what we might classify as negative feelings. Um, the number one emotion was frustrated. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you these data was uh, we had the privilege um, of collecting data just last week. So um, last Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, we did a national study in collaboration with CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. Um, I'm a proud board member of that organization. And um, in, in, to coincide with a, a, a webinar we were doing to support educator well-being, we asked teachers to complete a survey. And it was remarkable. We got about 5,000 teachers to complete the survey in just three days. And as you can see from the data, um, you know, this is, it's changed. Um, so if you go back, you know, frustration was, you know, the top emotion for teachers back in the last couple of years. Now it's just, everyone seems to be feeling anxiety, overwhelmed, um, stressed, et cetera. Now, why do we care about that? Well, what they told us in the research was that the causes of their anxiety and stress are related to things I think all of us would think they would be related to. Childcare problems, fear of getting sick themselves or for loved ones, you know, this new working from home, managing spouse, kids, school and work. Um, a colleague of mine wrote me this email. She goes, you know, online school started today. My vision of finally having someone else take care of my kids, even virtually, was smashed to smithereens. Uh, this requires 100% involvement, actually 200% because the girls are in different grades. So this woman is a professor, you know, her husband is a manager in a company. They are now both working from home. They, um, you know, are struggling. Um, obviously people are struggling. We know unemployment rates have skyrocketed, um, about finances, access to food and resources, just making sure there's a quality education. Um, I don't know about all of you, but um, at the center, you know, I'm at the center, you know, three, four days a week, I'm traveling, I'm on planes, doing presentations, teaching, and now I'm locked up at home. <laughs> and uh, it's been interesting emotionally for me. Um, and uh, worrying about like what's happening with the center that's now 65 people in, in their homes. And um, I think most of our, many of our educators are thinking that way about their own students. Um, can they even be in touch with their students? And they're also feeling isolated and lonely. You thought this was gonna be a positive presentation. I, there will be hope, I promise you. But unfortunately, we have to be realistic about what is going on right now. So when we asked teachers in our survey, you know, how are you dealing with your feelings? Um, I might ask you the same question. You know, anybody here gained a pound or two in the last couple of weeks? <laughs> Um, I have been eating, you know, my breakfast this morning went like on and on and on. I just sat there working in the kitchen, like, ah, oh, give me I'll have another piece of toast. So uh, we have another thing. Um, we're finding that people are just not regulating very well from consuming too much social media. I was a victim of that about two weeks ago, um, to oversleeping, to overeating, to not having clear routines, um, 
Scott and I were talking about this earlier about obsessive cleaning. You know, he thinks it's a good thing. I think it's okay, um, except um, there's just like so many times a day I can like take up, you know, Clorox wipe and wipe my refrigerator. <laughs> so right, we're, we know that on a daily basis, um, people are struggling with their anxiety. And think about this. We are asking teachers now to uh, teach in this new virtual world and how they're feeling you know, we know this from decades of research, influences all things about their performance, right? It's linked to their stress and burnout, which negatively influences engagement and motivation. It negatively impacts relationships and culture and discipline procedures they may be using, whatever that might mean in this current state. It derails us from our goals. Certainly it's affecting their health and well-being. And so what we want to argue in part is that educators' well-being can make or break the attainment of educational goals. Now, this next slide is a little overwhelming, and I apologize for that. But we ask teachers, in their own words, to just tell us, like, what do you need right now to support your well-being? So I want to pause here just for a minute and allow you to just read this. So let me give you about a minute to just take a quick look at this. And as you're reading this, you just might ask yourself a few questions like, what is my role in supporting educators, you know, in having greater well-being? You know, what is our school, what is our district doing to support what educators are asking for? And again, today we don't have all the answers. <clears throat> we just want to show you what the data are saying and what people are asking for. Uh, we do have some ideas for you, though. And if we jump to um, well-being supports for families and students, um, you can see our educators are concerned about the equity challenge for capacity. Um, our, our teachers in our, for example, um, in areas where there's um, high poverty, are they able to even reach their students? So just take a moment and read over that slide. And what I'd like to do before we jump um, to uh, the next section of our training is just pause here for a moment and just ask you, and Aaron will support us here, any thoughts? Um, I ask you maybe one big question, which is the data that I share with you on the emotions that our educators are feeling each day. Do you believe that that represents your school or district? Does that resonate with you? Um, are you hearing those are the feeling states? And, are you noticing the difficulties that people are having in dealing with their feelings? So maybe, Aaron, you could, if you can all go into your chat box um, and share with us, that would be sure. great. And if you don't know where that is, Aaron, maybe you can share with some people who may not know how to get there. Sure, there should be an option, and we're getting some answers now at the bottom or the top of your screen. It should say chat. You want to go there. So um, we're getting absolutely to your answer, uh, to your question mark, yes. Um, yes to all of this. Yes, it resonates. The challenge that we're facing is people are going overboard to be connected. And we're seeing this on so many levels. One person is asking us to go back to this slide with the family. I just, I put it up. I saw that. Right. Um, we're seeing a different style of teaching completely. Um, and just a lot of affirmatives that this resonates. Before I move on, are there any particular questions about the research or about um, what we've presented so far? No questions. Nice to see. What, okay. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, wait gonna, a second. Uh, um, there is a very good point. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, Janet is saying that there are so many things that are being sent. It's hard to decipher what's really important and what's not important as it pertains to research and advice that they're receiving. People are feeling overwhelmed by the information out there. That's what we heard from teachers as well, is that there needs to be better curating, because if you, you know, imagine every 
you know, at Yale University where we work, um, the chairs of our departments, the heads of the hospitals, the president, the vice president, I mean, you just get 20 emails a day about COVID-19, COVID-19 alert, alert. And it's like, how many of these do we forward to our team? You know, how do we curate these resources to not overwhelm people? Mm. So like less is more, as people are saying, definitely. There's also a comment that families are being so overwhelmed that they're almost considering taking their children out of distance learning and homeschooling them themselves. For sure. Um, I'm going to pause here and turn it over to Scott so that we can get through all of our content and then we can take more questions at the end. Thank you, Mark. So the next section um, really shifts gears a bit, but it's very connected. It focuses on the role of district leadership, whether you're a board member or whether you're in the administrative office as superintendent um, or, or other support roles. And how do you navigate through these uncertain times? And I think one of the, the things that we should reflect on just really a few weeks into this crisis is the velocity of decision-making that has ultimately come upon all of us in these positions. You know, at the end of the day, um, when you think about just the decision of when to close, the decision of how to navigate through um, putting together a budget now for the following school year, um, when all of this is unfolding day by day. And if you think about the 2008 crisis where the, you know, where Lehman, you know, went under in August slash September and, you know, school budgets um, weren't until many months later, this is reacting in real time. If you think about um, some of the obvious issues that have come up with e-learning on the policy side, um, with code of conduct, with just obviously the shift in pedagogy and how to deal with that, getting equipment to kids, getting kids fed. These are just, um, you know, absolutely, um, you know, a, a, a large velocity of issues coming at us at once. And so in order to try to navigate through this, we wanted to reflect back on some work that we did actually with our partners um, at the School Board Association and Superintendent Association in Connecticut, where we did a survey back in 2019, asking school board members for their opinions on a few different issues. And I think this will help try to um, you know, get us through um, this discussion. The first slide that we put up is a question that we asked, which is whether stress, burnout, and mental health is a challenge for students and if it's a challenge for teachers. And at the end of the day, if you look at um, the two big chunks of those pie charts um, in, in the student and the teacher pie chart, they're more or less giving us a similar picture that these are clearly um, large challenges for our districts. So there's no surprise about that. But if we flip to the next slide and we look at um, whether or not districts have had a plan to deal with these issues for students and for teachers, we see that the majority of districts did report that they have a plan to address these issues in their student populations, but less than a quarter had a plan to address these issues in their teacher populations and in their staff. Um, and so at a time like this, with all of the data that Mark just went through and all that feedback that we got last week from teachers um, that are obviously trying to um, do the best they can to get through this crisis, just like the rest of us, it's good to keep in mind that many, in many cases, we didn't have these natural structures in place to think about stress and burnout um, in our, in our, for our teachers. And so now that all these issues become amplified, it's going to become ever more important to try to think about ways in which we can support them. The second piece that we wanted to pull out from the survey work that we did, because this is also important as you think about the dynamics between uh, a superintendent and a board, is we asked the question, what do you think, what, what is the level of impact that you think the superintendent has on the district? And what is the level of impact that you think the board has on the district? And we asked this question of superintendents and of board members. And I will point out that we still have a relatively small sample size. We're gonna to look to do this across the country to really increase the sample size. But we wanted to share these preliminary results from, with you because we think it's really instructive. If you ask superintendents about impact, 100% of them agree that the board has a large or enormous impact on the district. If you ask board members that same question, the result is much more mixed. And I think the reason that it's important is because when crises happen and everybody is forced to make very quick and, and quite large decisions together, relative roles are, are sometimes strained and become murky and conflict can ensue. And, and when you have this differing opinion on, on impact, it just could really create um, differences in the way that whether it's board members or superintendents come at these issues in the boardroom. And so I think it's just something to be aware of. And it's an interesting piece of data you know, that we uncovered when we did this analysis. And then if we flip to the next slide, um, we just wanted to hit on two more points here from this 2019 survey. Uh, we asked the question about you know, managing conflict and whether um, as a board, 
you have room to improve in managing conflict. And it's no surprise. I mean, I think this is the case for the majority of us out there. Um, we can always improve in that. And if you look at the biggest pieces of the pie chart, um, it's either great room for improvement, much room for improvement, some room for improvement. So, you know, so clearly there's, I think, an understanding out there that managing conflict is not easy. And it's something that even again, in the best of times, we all need to work on. And then the very last um, piece of the survey um, question that we wanted to uh, bring out for all of you today is a question about giving feedback. And we asked the question, you know, are board members comfortable giving, or how frequent was actually the question, how frequent do um, board members give feedback to superintendents and to other board members? And you know, the majority of the respondents to the superintendent question said, you know, often and always. Um, it, was, it was almost 80% of the respondents. But when asked about you know, giving feedback to their peers, to other school board members, you know, the numbers shrunk a little bit, 25% always, 33% often. So there's a good portion of, of um, respondents that said sometimes rarely or, or a few said never. And I think one of the things that we're gonna point out you know, very shortly in this presentation is that giving you know, honest and transparent and feedback as difficult as it may be is even more important now than it probably was a month ago, even though it was important a month ago. Um, and, and in order to get through a, a time like this of uncertainty and of crisis, and in order to be working together, um, this is gonna be of, of just tantamount importance. So with that as a backdrop, um, we wanted to share with you some research that was done with corporate boards. It was done by um, McKinsey, a large consulting firm, and the NACD, which is an organization that um, is for corporate directors specifically. And they did a piece last year, well before um, COVID-19, that just focused on board dynamics in a crisis. And I think the first thing to think about is like what happens in a crisis? So we know that it's a low impact, or sorry, low probability, high impact event. Um, we also know that organizations, whether they're corporations or schools, typically do have some kind of an emergency plan on the shelf for times like this. Um, I mentioned earlier that obviously decisions need to be made and they're quite big and they're quite quick and it could be anything from financial to regulatory to legal, um, safety, communications, all, all the above. We also know that in the environment in which we live, most of our towns have a social media network that makes the stakes even higher because there's continued chatter in the community about every decision that gets made. And so this real-time feedback loop and rumors that could be out there um, are something that, although it's very difficult to control, we just have to acknowledge um, that it exists and, and we add that to um, you know, what we need to manage as we kind of continue through a crisis. And then there's no doubt about it that I think with every um, expert from um, you know, a business school management perspective that's looked at this problem, what they would say is that everything in a crisis around relationships and around um, governance and leadership gets tested and any weakness that there was originally ends up getting exacerbated. And when, when the McKinsey study asked corporate board members, um, you know, do you, are you prepared for, are you prepared for a crisis? You know, the resounding answer is no, because only 8% of corporate directors said that they participated in crisis management exercises. And I would guess that that's probably very similar in school board land, where even though there may be an emergency plan on the shelf, it's not always the case that, that every board member will spend a lot of time um, going through simulations. And then secondly, when asked about um, whether or not they've had explicit discussions with management teams on roles and responsibilities, only 25% of corporate directors, and these were of large companies, said that they had those discussions. So oftentimes we find ourselves in situations like this you know, without necessarily having practiced um, any sort of a simulation to get us through. So as we transition to the next slide, we thought this was an interesting comment that was again in this McKinsey report that came from a board chairman of a large company it says preparation is useful and important, but personal relationships and emotions can't be predetermined or rehearsed. CEOs and board leaders need to get granular about emotions as well as tactics in considering crisis response. And when Mark and I saw this, I think one of the things that you know, we thought about was some of the work um, that you know, Mark's done through the years and that we talk about a lot at our center about being an emotion scientist versus, an emo versus a judge. And, we all come at issues and problems <clears throat> and board meetings, even in the best of times, with our own you know, biases or agendas or 
or just things that sort of formulate our views on, on situations. I mean, I, just to pull one out of the hat, you can, you can look at an issue like school start times and you can say, I'm coming at it with a public health perspective because I know that the research is really clear. So if I go into the boardroom and I'm talking about start times, I don't care what anybody else says, you know, this is the most important thing. Somebody else may come in and say, I'm coming in with my experience around you know, fiscal responsibility and taxpayers. And so if school start time movement is gonna cost $3 million to deploy because of busing and all kinds of scheduling complexity, I don't wanna do it. And then you get a very you know, quick clash of that sort of emotional response of, of their, you know, their, their, their history and everything that came up to that point as they go into the boardroom. At a time like this, that gets amplified even further because we all come at this with our preconceived notions. And it really behooves, I think, all of us, um, including us at the center, when we have our meetings at the center with each other, to try to really um, you take a step back and think scientifically rather than in a judgmental way when someone reacts a certain way. And of course, we also don't know what people are dealing with in their personal lives right now. And we know that there's a huge array of challenges out there, whether it's health challenges, whether it's financial challenges in families, in whether it's teachers or parents, parents in our community. So all of that, all of that is a, um, is, is a real, uh, is, is a real thing that we have to keep in the back of our mind. So then the last piece of this McKinsey study, um, and I think that if our friends at the School Board Association and Superintendent Association looked at this, they would find it to be very familiar because because a lot of um, training goes on in the state of Connecticut on an annual basis. And I think a lot of the things that are pointed to in the study are very, very similar to best practices that we would use at any point in time in order to try to you know, keep the boardroom functioning well. You know, the first is just boards that have an over-reliance on administration where they're not really active enough or asking the right questions or, or, or being appropriately challenging to serve in that corporate governance role or in our case, you know, in school board governance as their um, as they're charged to do. Well, on the flip side, we also know that there are situations where board members, you know, all of us fall into the trap of micromanagement and crossing that line into issues that really the superintendent should be charged with because they're the ones managing the district day to day and that doesn't change in, in a crisis. And so it's finding this very careful balance where you're exercising your duty as a board member, where you're um, absolutely, you know, focused on governance responsibilities and you're involved in those critical decisions while allowing the administration to carry on in managing the district day to day, it's ever more important. The third thing that's, that um, was pointed out in this study was problematic board dynamics getting amplified. And we've touched on this already, so I won't belabor it, but it's really just the concept of saying that if there is um, a conflict on your board, if there is a relationship struggle that happens between let's say the board chair and the superintendent, in an environment like this, it is going to probably be exacerbated. And so fostering trust and really trying to manage through conflict is important. And what's one of the best ways to do that? Number four, which is just keep the information flowing. As difficult as it is and as time pressured as we all are, that frequent and clear communication where you avoid surprises and you maximize transparency um, is, is really, I think, the best advice you know, that we have from a boardroom perspective right now, just to try to keep the process as constructive as possible and to try to keep everybody together to face the serious challenges that you know that we, as we're trying to to get through this day by day so if you, and then um, with that let me um, let me just uh, I'm gonna now go to a, a slightly different topic but again also related and what we'll have a chance um, for questions in just a minute um, but we wanted to touch on this concept of school climate and district climate. We've spent a lot of time at our center on this. We asked this question in our Connecticut survey back in 2019, about 49% of board respondents said that they would characterize their emotional climate in their district as either moderately or highly positive, which is great, um, or slightly positive, but I'm oh, sorry, 49% were moderately or highly positive, but then 51% said it was either slightly positive, neutral, or negative. So we all know that um, in our districts, we have a lot of work to do in good times on, on climate. Uh, but obviously in this environment, how do you even think about climate? How do you even have a construct to think about climate? So we tried to put together the beginning of that construct. And as I go through this, I would say, if you have any ideas or practices that you've already begun or are about to start on in your districts, 
please feel free to um, just chat that through and we'll try to you know, share some, Erin can share some of those out because this is clearly um, gonna be a process um, that, that you know, will be iterative and that we wanna get community input on. But the first domain, if you will, is physical and emotional safety. And when we think about that, it's issues like, you know, really trying to think about your school's values and, and not to change them in this time period, but really make sure that you're communicating them as you would in any other time period. Think about all those um, norms around e-learning and try to you know, communicate that out to faculty, staff, and the community. Um, not forgetting about issues like data, data privacy and, and code of conduct issues with electronics, which I know in this environment, it's, it's super difficult to manage. Making resources available, whether that's counselors or psychologists or um, different um, sources of information for families to access during this time. So all those are some ideas um, that we had in that first domain, as well as just making sure that you know, we're understanding of um, students facing you know, multiple challenges. With diversity, equity, inclusion, I think obviously this crisis brings out some pretty stark differences um, in students' ability and teachers' ability for that matter to work from home. Maybe they don't have internet connections. Maybe they don't have equipment. So we know that people are in different places on that front and it's obviously important to be aware. It's also important just to keep in the back of our, in the front of our minds really, the financial and health related issues that certain families may have while other families won't have those issues. And so there's a, there's a big diversity of, um, of where families are these days. And then of course, um, understanding the wide range of students needs. Some students may need um, the intensity that they had before this crisis began because that's gonna be the best way to keep them engaged and others may need space. They absolutely may need space and they may, may need latitude to try to get through this. And we all read about um, COVID-19 related bias. And so that's something we of course wanna do everything we can to protect against. Third domain is relationships, whether it's student to student, adult to adult or adult to student. You know, I don't have to go through all of them, but we have some ideas on here about how to try to keep all of this alive. Um, you know, I've been hearing stories more and more now with schools that are trying to get in their high schools and middle schools, the extracurricular activities up and running online to the extent that they can be. I mean, that's just excellent to try to keep you know, kids engaged and interacting with each other. Um, and I know that it's, again, more difficult in some places than others, but, but you know, working towards um, getting these relationships to you know, move into a virtual world is going to be critical. Then we have supporting teaching practices. I think for most of us, we would say that if we had a, a dramatically new teaching initiative that we were gonna put forth in a district, we would spend a year planning for it. We would have thoughtful professional development. Even with RULER, when you go through RULER training at our center, we tell you to spend one year um, working just among the adults before you bring this into the classroom. Yet we've literally gone to a virtual environment and an e-learning environment in like a week. It's, it's almost unfathomable. And I think we all have to you know, have that perspective and try to get across to our communities that that is a challenge that we face. And there's a high community expectation sometimes, but there's also the practical reality of we need to support teaching practices in that it's hard to do overnight. Maintaining whole child approach and frameworks and goals are all super important. And then lastly, the sense of community. Um, just trying to think of ways, whether they're fun ways or creative ways to continue on with whether it's contests or speeches or performances, whether it's music or anything that you may do just to brighten people's lives in a time that obviously they're experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety. So that was our first attempt to do this. And again, if anybody has anything they want to share, I would actually ask Erin if anything's come through. Absolutely. Um, a lot has come through actually. And they center a lot on relationships, school pride and a sense of community. So we have some communities focusing structuring actually everything around connected connectedness and communications um there's community night bell ringing i know that's happening in my district a lot of um, emphasis on student voice all staff check-ins with the superintendent done virtually leveraging social media to have parents and teachers share pictures and videos of, of students and families um, establishing a good cadence to communication. So there's an expectation that's being met um, on behalf of the school communities and then the receiving parents. And then also su a superintendent is checking in on classes. So kind of dropping in on, on these distance learning um, environments to make sure that everything's going great and everyone has what they need. That's excellent. And I think that we wanna as a center continue to gather these ideas because we want to just try to be 
um, a resource for everyone and we'll try to continue to gather ideas and get them out there any way we can because I think we'll all learn from each other. We always say at the center, we don't always have all the answers, but when we see what schools are doing, we always get inspired with ruler work. This is no different. I think we're gonna see a lot of creativity out there and, and getting those best practices around can go a long way to help us all think through some of these issues. Any other uh, questions just before we transition to um, the next section, which Mark's gonna take us through um, looking at leaders as role models. And there'll be time for Q&A at the end as well. Okay. All right. Um, if questions come in, we'll save them for the end. What I wanted to do uh, in this section, you know, is, is when we think about, you know, social and emotional learning, when we think about, you know, whole child development, it, it, it is going from the macro level um, influences like the school climate pieces, you know, the idea of safety in our school to relationships in our school, et cetera. But it also goes down to the individuals. And what I think we have to just acknowledge based on the data that I shared earlier is that we are in a place where people are experiencing chronic stress. And I think it's important for us all to understand what that means in terms of how we think, how we interact, how that influences the way we behave. So a few things about that. One is just how we define chronic stress is when we are feeling like our things in our lives are unpredictable. Um, we, we know that's the case right now. We never, none of us know when we're actually gonna go back into our offices. Uncontrollable, like none of us have any control over the situation. And when you're in it, it's like a toothache. It feels like it's gonna never go away. And so it's, it's sustained. And those are the three factors you know, that we would call are related to chronic stress. Um, we know from our research that many are feeling that way. And I think as you've seen on the news all too often, um, that chronic stress makes us, you know, it just makes us sense danger around the clock. And coupled with some of us, you know, my sleep habits have changed dramatically, I'm trying to get back on my exercise routine, you know, the kind of basic self-care that is changed a lot because parents are stretched, you know, in the evenings and not taking care of themselves as much as they would like to. We behave in crazy ways. These are the extremes you know, from spraying people to gargling with cocks to panic buying um, to saying mean or hurtful things to catastrophic thinking, right? I think what's important to know about how our brains react when we're feeling chronic stress is that sometimes they even lie to us. Um, the, the example I always give is turbulence. So I fly a lot. I get anxious when I fly from turbulence. And so you, you're there without any information. You make a story up, you know, going to for sure the engine's going to get clogged today for sure the rain is too heavy and it's going to weigh the plane down for sure whatever's going to happen lo and behold i asked my cousin who's a pilot like what's up with turbulence and he said to me well mark didn't you know like there's never been a plane crash because of turbulence and then all of a sudden right i can't use that um that information i use that information in a very different way so what we're going to talk about now are really the strategies that we can use ourselves to be role models and that we can also ensure that our educators are using to support them in healthy stress and anxiety management. When we define emotion regulation, it's basically the things that we think about and the things that we do um, that help us to manage our feelings in order to achieve goals, whether it be our well-being, our relationship quality, making good decisions, or just general you know, workplace performance. There are myriad strategies. And what I want to say to you um, is that we as a center have done a number of webinars uh, this week on all of these strategies. So if you feel like the educators in your schools would benefit from like serious training on emotion management when it comes to physiological regulation, like just dealing with that activation or the key points around self-care or what it means in, um, in terms of relationships or how to manage their thinking or create routines, and doing things and even forgiveness, please, we will send you those links and make sure you get those webinars out to them because we've gotten tremendous feedback, you know, that they've been uh, helpful. We're gonna focus on a few here just because of time. The first is relationships. Everyone here, whether it's, whether you're a superintendent, a school board member, or a four-year-old in preschool, right, has a basic need to be seen, heard, and met. Sadly, what research showed before this crisis was that about 
50% of teachers said they have strong relationship with their students. And only about a third of students say they agree, you know, that they have strong relationships with their teachers. So the question is, are they a cost? No, all our webinars are free to everyone. So please know we're not charging for any of these materials. They are available to everyone at no cost. Um, now you can imagine um, if two thirds of our students are saying they don't have a strong relationship um, with their teachers when they're actually in the classroom, what those data might look like right now um, in this new virtual educating, education world. A few things that I think are important to know. One, the mere presence of a caring adult, whether they are online um, you know, or whether they um, are in person, right, reduces the effects of stress. So literally, just knowing that there is an adult there for you who cares for you. And what's interesting about this is that you don't necessarily even have to do anything. And I hate to say it that way, but it's the truth. It's just that perception that I know that this person cares about me. And I think one thing that we forget in these difficult times is that we're used to showing empathy in a traditional way. You know, my, I'm so sorry about your finances. I'm so sorry about this. And I, I feel badly about that. And oh my goodness, which is all good empathy. But there's another form of empathy that I think that we can engage in right now and just trying to find ways to celebrate the positive things. And what's interesting about this research is that when people uh, have been in, in studies have reflected on the people who provide them that general empathy, like for a misfortune versus this positive empathy, they actually report having better relationships with the people who give them the positive empathy. Because we as people, like we like it when people make us feel good and sometimes the other kind of empathy while it's helpful can can bring us down a few things about managing your cognition there are two evidence-based strategies that we hope all of you will think about using um, i don't know about you but um, it's been uh, my negative talk has exacerbated over the last couple of weeks in terms of like, oh my goodness, you know, like I'm never going to be able to retire, you know, oh my goodness, like I'm going to be trapped here for the rest of my life. Um, like it's amazing how our default, you know, and we're not going to go into the history of where I got that negative talk from, um, but maybe some of you can relate to, you know, this. Um, so some tricks to that. Um, you know, years ago, we used to say, teach our kids like, I think I can, I think I can. And what research shows is actually that's not as effective um, as literally putting yourself in the third person, re referencing yourself. So for me, like when I'm having like this feeling of having a breakdown, I'm like, Mark, you're a professor of emotional intelligence. You can get through this. And that what's called psychological distance is a way of literally building empathy for yourself. Think about that. By just saying your name and referring to yourself in the third person, and saying something positive, it's a way to help you deactivate. Another one we call reappraisal. This is uh, actually a creative exercise where we look at a situation through a different lens. So um, I made this one up for Scott. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but as an example, right, this leadership thing at a distance is never gonna work. Instead, right, the way he, you know, what Scott could do, this is not advice for you, Scott, this is just a, a make-believe scenario. Um, is you take a step back and you say, wait a minute, like, Scott, this is an opportunity to empower your team. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of um, using creativity to change your negative thinking to a more positive way of thinking. So I want to just wrap up um, right now and just say that um, let's try to put this all together right? Educators, um, emotions matter, right? We know that how you feel matters a great deal, right? Um, anxiety among teachers is at an all-time high. You know, we need systems to support educator and student well-being, and our center wants to be of service to you. You know, many of you may know this, but we have uh, started an initiative with generous support from various foundations to make Connecticut the first emotionally intelligent state, and we are sticking to it. Um, we are proud to have worked with over 200 of our Connecticut schools in large districts. Some of you are potentially on our webinar today. Um, 
and we want to continue to support you. Right now, what we can do for you is we can offer you these free webinars um, and obviously deeper training later on. And Scott, you want to just do these last uh, three? Sure. So, you know, we spoke about just thinking about leadership and governance practices that'll get us through these times. And I think the main message there is just all those best practices that you thought about before um, this came upon us are still absolutely relevant. And just because all problems get amplified in a crisis, it's just more important than ever to double down on those best practices. Uh, the school climate, just, I know it's hard in these first bunch of days of e-learning because it's really putting out fires, but taking that step back and just having some perspective and saying, we really do still have a school climate and we do have some control over it. So how do we, how do we try to um, shape that in a virtual world is a, is a good exercise to think about and maybe an exercise that students, especially at the high school and middle school level, um, can be a part of and can, can be thought partners in that. And then um, being a role model, um, as Mark said, and, and just thinking about some of the personal best practices that then we can bring to those that, that we're leading. So we've done a lot of sharing and now maybe we can end with a little reflecting. Um, one of the ways we also can be um, our best selves is by literally being preventative, meaning that when we, um, you know, before we get on a webinar like this, you know, if I'm feeling like my life is a mess, right, I certainly don't want to enter into that webinar with my brain in that place. When you're having a board meeting, whether it be vir it's virtual now, I'm sure, when you're having faculty meetings, um, let me ask all of you to take a moment and think about some adjectives that you might use to describe your best self. Just take a moment and think about that. A way to think about this would be as a leader, as a board member, I would like to be seen. I'd like to be talked about. I'd like to be experienced as someone who has these qualities. What are those qualities? Maybe just take a moment and if you feel comfortable being public with your best self qualities, just type them in. We have positing, encouraging, and open. Compassion. Compassion. Thank you, Aaron. Calm, engaging, good listener, reflective, strong, positive, passionate, kind. Empathetic, thoughtful, honest, team player, approachable, present, inspirational, trustworthy, competent, genuine, joyous, caring, an advocate, empathetic, observant. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. And so what we want to encourage you during to pause. Am I muted? No. You're back. Oh, okay. What I'd like to encourage you to do um, over the next couple of weeks and really for your whole life is, you know, before you enter into a difficult situation or if you're irritated or frustrated or overwhelmed or anxious, just give yourself the permission to pause and literally think about these adjectives. Because what we know, just very briefly, is that when you're in that state of arousal where you're activated, Right, you're gonna go right for the jugular. But when you take that breath and pause and activate your best self, it brings you back to your values and it allows you to be calmer and obviously be a better listener, be that emotion scientist who can then be supportive. So on that note, um, what we wanna do is just say, you know, thank you for Bob for allowing us to present to Cabe and Fran who's on the phone I believe, or from CAPS and for your support for this to our superintendents and school board members. Um, importantly, um, for those of you who under, know about Ruler, we have, uh, we have converted to online institutes for the next six months. So if your schools are interested in doing the you know, systemic approach, please reach out to us. And importantly for our superintendents, we have, um, with the generous support of a local funder, created what's called the Seedlings Institute for Educational Leaders. Originally, it was going to be in July, but we wanted to be responsive and be aware that that's not a good time right now. So we've moved it to October, and we just highly encourage you to come to that training. It is specifically for superintendents and district level administrators who want to think about doing systemic social emotional learning in their schools and districts. 
Scott, would you like to say a few last things? We appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. We've worked with you know many schools around Connecticut, and we're just really proud of, of all the work that they do in the realm of emotional intelligence and social emotional learning. And I think our message is we just want to you know keep doing that work, which is now more important than ever before um, as we try to you know together you know figure out a way to make our way through this. And Bob, would you like to say something? Yeah, I want to just thank you and Scott and Aaron for this wonderful, wonderful. Uh, time we spent together. Um, by the way, I went through Seedlings last year. It is a tremendous program. You should do it if you can get into it. It's, uh, there are a lot of people who, who Mark and um, Scott have trained over the years. It's just a tremendous opportunity. And the okay. last, I want to ask one final question, Mark, if that's okay. And sure. that would be, and that would be, we have Passover and Easter coming up. And for the first time in the tradition in my, my family, the first time probably in a hundred years that we will not be getting together as an extended family. And I understand that that will lead to more stress for people. How would you handle it? Well, it's funny that you were mentioning this because last night when Scott and I were preparing for this, I share with him a text that I got from my brother, which was uh, a Passover table with five laptops, you know, all looking at each other <laughs> and saying, you know, welcome to Passover 2020. You know, I think that again, you know, part of the work we do is, is just giving ourselves the permission to be annoyed about it, right? It's so it's just, it is what it is. Again, we have no control over it. So knowing that we don't have control over it, right, helps us to shape the way we think about it. Right. If we just obsess about the stock market, for example, like what do I have to do to control the stock market? <laughs> like there's nothing I can do. So um, the it's the same thing applies to, you know, our current situation with social distancing. Right. And we have to we know the research shows that not being together will prevent further spread of the virus. So that's research based data that helps us right to engage in behavior that's hopefully the healthiest for ourselves and others. And I think that, again, right, my best self is not having, you know, a family gathering right now. My best self is doing it this way. And I think, you know, being compassionate and as every, all those additives came up, um, is doing what's best for not only ourselves, but the greater good. Thank you so much. Scott, do, would you like to just... And I would just add the one other thing, which is it's hard to imagine now, but I think next year, which let's let's hope that the situation is is not upon us anymore. It'll make the gathering that much sweeter, and we'll appreciate it that much more, because I think you know I, I I think that's this is in this crisis. That's one thing that did stick out of me too. It's like family gatherings that have traditions that go back decades and decades to so all of a sudden have that be discombobulated. It's, it's very disconcerting. So so we'll all look forward to next year. So while we, you know, I know some of you obviously have, you know, major agendas, but we can take five minutes and just, you know, uh, stay on and answer any questions. Let us know any resources that you would like at this present time. So please take a moment and um, sure. chat, chat with us. I do have a question. It's a fantastic one. How do you ask questions when your administrative team is in the hot zone of decision making. Um, and then we have a few follow ups, but let's, let's talk about that one first, Mark. So I think that's where, you know, if you're a leader and you understand the science of emotion, right, you have to figure out a calming strategy, right? And, you know, everybody has different, like when Scott, you know, we talked about biases, every one of us has a bias around like what works and what doesn't work, right? Some people like breathing exercises, some people think that's hokey. Some people say, you know what, let's all just take a minute to ourselves, to gather ourselves, to think about our best selves. There's no right or wrong, but there is um, best practice uh, for supporting people in making sound decisions. And we know from research that when you're highly activated, it is not a good place to be in to make sound decisions. So you've got to figure out whatever it takes, pausing, giving space, etc., to deactivate. Excellent. And same person, um, what roles should board members be taking on right now? 
Um, this person has defined their role as staying informed and attending online meetings, but she's not feeling like a member of a decision-making body, but she also doesn't want to micromanage. So how do you strike that balance and do what you're supposed to be doing? Yep, and, and Bob, you should definitely chime in on this as well, because obviously like Kate sure. spends a lot of time thinking about this, but it, I, I almost would say that you go back to looking at, again, putting this crisis aside, you look at the definition of the role that a board has and you try to stick to that definition. And I, it's a really delicate balance, but I think that you, you don't want to fall into either trap because either, either end of the spectrum is dangerous. If you are literally, you know, they're making day-to-day -day decisions on the rollout of e-learning and every machination, like that's clearly not appropriate. But if you're not there for those really large and substantive financial and policy oriented decisions, um, then that is also not um, appropriate because you're ultimately, you know, held accountable for it. And so, so it's, it's really trying to think about that role that you play on policy, governance, accountability, um, and, and, and to be a sounding board. And I think when big decisions need to be made, you know, even I would, I, I think I would think of best practices, even when big decisions need to be made that may not be exactly in the board's pur purview, I think taking the small amount of time to make sure that everybody does have the information and that they do serve as a sounding board without that micromanagement element could pay dividends because if a decision is made and then the board later on decides that they were on the opposite end of that decision, then you have an even bigger problem later than at least having that conversation beforehand. But Bob, why don't, why don't you also add to that? Yeah, I, I would just add, and I thought you said it beautifully, Scott. I would just add that board members should remember that they're representatives of the community and they should be doing a lot of public engagement. Not that they're making the decisions, but telling people, uh, uh, building those relationships, telling people what's going on, make sure that um, students are doing what they should be doing at this point. Um, that's another very big part of what board members should be doing. Um, certainly they have a job ensuring that the superintendent is supported at this time, but that doesn't mean they can't ask questions if they think things are uh, not going exactly as they should. Um, but again, it's a balancing act. I know some boards uh, won't have a, a real meeting for quite a while. Um, I always think it's best to reach out. We've done that with our board. We haven't had a meeting, but we certainly are in touch with our board. We encourage our members of our board to be in touch with the people out in the field and bringing back great ideas and bringing back thoughts of the feelings in the community are something that the board really should be helping with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when you think about like that individual bit of feedback that, you know, X, X's third grade class is not getting any e-learning, like that's, if you think about that kind of an issue in a normal time, the best way to handle it is to try to channel that back to either the third grade teacher or the principal of that school. But when there are broader issues and these days, I mean, with every other day, there's a broad issue that comes up. Then, you know, they become issues that I think are, are very well placed for boards to play a role in. Our latest issue in New York that came up in the last three days was that um, for most of the districts, um, maybe not all, but the vast majority, they had a scheduled spring break for next week. It was in every contract, on every calendar, in every everything. It was done a year ago, literally a year ago. And the governor came out with an executive order and said, not in this environment. You're not going on spring break. No. So that, as you can imagine, has lots of ripple effects. And so every district, you know, had to figure out a way through it. And, and that, that was a, a joint effort, really, between, um, you know, boards thinking about board issues and superintendents thinking about those day-to-day those -day management issues and trying to come up with a plan in every district to, to handle what they were going to do. That's just one of probably, you know, 15 or 20 different things that we've had to deal with in the last, you know, two or three weeks. Our boards are making decisions like that too all the time. And they also have to stay in touch with their towns and their cities, especially now, which should be budget time. But building relationships in a situation like this is some of the most beneficial things you can do for the long term. Couldn't agree more. Thanks, Bob. And, you know, that idea that we mentioned around just being your best self is like, it, does, it never hurts to be your best self. Right, it does hurt to be your worst self because it's a it's a great way to, you know, to have regrets and oftentimes you know uh, have some enemies, and you know, 
as the, as the Viktor Frankl quote goes, right between that trigger or stimulus and response, there's that space, you know, and we get to choose our response in that space. And, you know, our center's work is trying to support you in using the skills of emotional intelligence to make informed decisions, build positive relationships, certainly support your health and well being. And we know that all contributes to better academic performance and better workplace performance. So uh, there's our information. Um, I hope that you'll reach out and Aaron on our team will be in touch with you via email with this webinar and also all the additional resources. And um, so from, from Mark, I'm gonna say thank you for coming out today, uh, Bob and Scott. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. If you have ideas on things we should be doing, please let us know. All right, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.